Chapter 6 Saturday, August 21, SUP ST SUP, 1852 Being married is something else. Sarah rises early as I do, and we spend some quiet time together before the rest of the camp wakes. I watch her make breakfast and I write in my journal. I enjoy getting to know her a little more each day and her siblings are fun young people. I do enjoy that Jack has taken to following me around and helping me with whatever he can. We're now headed back to Clover Creek where we were camped several weeks ago. We should be able to make it back by mid-September if the captains keep up the pace we've been moving at. They say by traveling 25 miles per day and taking no days off unless we hit severe rains, we'll have more time to get our homes finished by winter. I think this first year will be a log cabin, and next summer will be a real house. I can then use the cabin as my workshop. I do not feel like we'll have time to build a house before winter, and I want my family to be safe and warm through our coldest season. I do not know what the cold temperatures will be like in Clover Creek, and I pray they aren't as bad as they are in Pennsylvania. At least I will have my family to help me chink while I build. I can put the children on it immediately while Sarah can help as she has time. I know we can make it before winter. I'm determined. I have a family to take care of now, and it is my greatest desire to see them content. Perhaps by winter, we'll have another addition to the family growing. I love the idea of having babies with Sarah. Hopefully it will happen soon. Driving the following day, Elmer counted his blessings. He hadn't had to buy a wagon, which would have eaten up all his money. He had a family now. He had two claims waiting for him in Clover Creek. And he would have the tools he needed to begin the carpentry work he'd been training for. There were even enough oxen that he could start a small ranch as well. He knew a lot of work went into ranching, but he had help. It would be glorious. While Elmer dreamed of the future, Sarek trudged behind the wagons with her friends and all the children. Mary was walking around with her musket to her shoulder, trying to get some meat for their suppers. Hannah was beside Sarah because she was worried about her friend. I really think you should talk to Jed about your anger toward God. I'm not saying I wouldn't be angry in your shoes, but my Jed always has the right words in situations like this. Sarah sighed. I'm not ready. Perhaps in a week or two I'll be able to talk about all of it, but I lost my father just three days ago. I should be allowed to be mad for a while. Hannah sighed. I really do think Jed could make you feel better. Perhaps. I'll talk to him when I'm ready. Katie Bedwell joined them then. How are you holding up, Sarah? Losing your father and marrying the next day? That's a very bold move. Sarah sighed. I'm doing my best for the children. There is no doubt in my mind that's what you're doing, Katie said. I know how frightened I was when my husband died, and how afraid I was to take on a new husband when I didn't know how the children would be treated. It's all worked out for me, though. Sarah smiled. I'm glad. I think it's going to work out for me too. The children seem happy, and I have a great deal of respect for Elmer. And from what I understand, marrying you when he did benefited him as well. Katie looked behind her to check on the children. Our group seems so much smaller with just two families gone. Think of who left though, Sarah said, shaking her head. The two worst behaved boys in the company, and Edna Blue, who wasn't poorly behaved, just different. She certainly did make an impression, didn't she? Hannah responded. I wish all the families had settled with us, but I can understand why some needed to go their own way. Are we still doing our 25-mile days without Sundays off? Sarah asked. We are, Hannah said. The captains want us to have time to build before winter, and we've made almost miraculous time the whole journey. We're going to make the most of it. The captain wants us back in Clover Creek by mid-September, so we have the best chance of making it through the winter. 
It's strange only having one captain again, Katie said. But Mr. Cauldron and his family went a different way. I do hope we'll see them again. I do as well. They may feel the need to visit because Betty, Mrs. Cauldron's sister, is settling near us, Hannah said. I'm so thankful we'll have a doctor in our settlement. Yes. Sarah said. I worry that without a doctor we'd end up like the Roanoke colony. We'll have a blacksmith, many farmers, many ranchers, a general store, a restaurant, a boarding house, and so much more. A furniture maker, Sarah added. Elmer? Hannah asked. Sarah nodded. His father wanted him to farm with him, but Elmer has already been through an apprenticeship for furniture, and he won't change his mind. Is that the problem between the two of them? Hannah asked, shaking her head. Why do men have to be so hard-headed about everything? Are you saying the pastor is something less than perfect? Katie asked. Hannah laughed. Of course not. Oh, and we'll have a preacher. It will feel like a real town rather quickly. It will be a real town quickly, Sarah said. Elmer wants to be outside of town. He wants a plot with more trees so he can use them to make his furniture. I hope he makes rocking chairs, Hannah said. I'm going to want one when the baby comes. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Katie asked. I'm hoping I can talk George into making one for me before our little one makes an appearance. Are you expecting as well? Sarah asked. At times it felt like she was the only woman in the company who hadn't gotten pregnant along the trail. Katie nodded. It happened very quickly. I wasn't expecting to have more children, but I won't turn down a blessing from God. Sarah smiled. I'm sure it will be a beautiful baby. She said nothing about the blessing from God part of things. Why would he be blessing others and taking people from her? What had she done that was so terrible she deserved to have her parents killed? For the noon meal, they had leftovers from the night before. Elmer prayed, blessing the hands who had prepared the food. I had no idea I was marrying such a good cook. Sarah smiled. I enjoy cooking. I'm glad you like it. I have a feeling you'll be eating a lot of my cooking in the future. I think you're probably right about that. He grinned at her. Poppy ate her food, but said, Mother used to make us chicken and dumplings. Will you make me chicken and dumplings, Sarah? Well, it's hard to make them on the trail, but once we settle in Clover Creek, I'll make them for you. I like them too. Sarah smiled at her sister, who seemed content with knowing she would get chicken and dumplings soon. How long until we reach Clover Creek? A month or so. A month. We've already been walking for 15 years. Sarah laughed. How is that possible when you were already five when we started, and now you're six? I don't know. Poppy stamped her foot. I don't want to walk anymore. To Sarah's surprise, Elmer said, You are always welcome to sit on the wagon seat with me. You don't have to do it all day, but it would give your little feet a break from walking so much. Poppy looked down at her feet. My feet aren't little. They're big. Elmer chuckled. Pardon me. They are much bigger than I realized. Poppy wandered away then, not seeming to care about riding in the wagon. Sarah smiled at Elmer. I think you handled her perfectly. You gave her a choice about walking, and now she knows she can do what she wants. I think all of us just need choices. We have four more hours to go this afternoon. You can ride with me as well. Sarah smiled, realizing she was thinking more highly of this man than she thought she would be. I'm glad I married you, Elmer. A smile lit up his face. That's awfully nice to hear. You're a good person, and I would have to be crazy not to be pleased, she said softly. The day was long, and they walked until almost sunset as always. When they reached their destination for the day, 
The same spot where they'd camped the night her father had died, Sarah sat looking at the trail sadly. There was no remnant of his grave as they had driven every wagon over the spot where they'd buried him. Sarah remembered exactly where he'd been buried and returned to the spot, kneeling beside his grave. I'm sorry you died, father, but I think we're going to be all right. She took a deep breath, realizing it was a privilege to be able to visit his grave one last time. She'd never been able to return to her mother's. I married the king boy, Elmer. He's agreed to help me raise the children, and I think I'm falling in love with him. We all miss you so much, but we're going to go on without you because there's nothing else we can do. Elmer found her there ten minutes later, the tears still streaming down her face. Are you all right? he asked, kneeling on the ground beside her. She sniffled and nodded. This was where we buried my father. You can't even see that it was once a grave. His arm went around her, and he pulled her against him. I'm so sorry. Me too. She let herself rest against him for a moment, and then got to her feet. Supper needs to be fixed, and I do believe this is a good place to do laundry. There's dancing tonight, he said softly. I'd love to dance with you. She smiled and nodded. I'll do the laundry, and while it's drying, we'll dance. Poppy will help me. She won't like it, but she'll do it. What's for supper? he asked. She smiled. I thought I'd take some jerky and cut it into tiny pieces, then make a gravy from it that I'll serve over mashed potatoes. I'm so glad they had potatoes in stock. That sounds delicious. My ma wanted to make something like that, and my pa said he wouldn't eat it. We had beans any night, there wasn't fresh meat, so almost every single night. He shook his head. Save a few of the potatoes, and we'll plant them in the spring. I don't know if they'll grow, but I certainly do hope so. I'm a little more adventurous of a cook than that. You may find yourself eating some very strange things being married to me. He laughed. Sounds like I'll have a lifetime of adventure with you. She giggled a little. I think you may. Having gone to her father's grave and telling him how she was handling things lifted her heart. She found it easy to laugh now. She'd visit once more before they left in the morning, but she didn't think it would be as hard as it had been the last time. When they reached the wagon, she climbed in for the potatoes, flour, and jerky. Taking them all near the fire, she set everything down, and then she got some water that had already been boiled. Elmer watched her cook as if it was the most fascinating thing he'd ever seen. While he watched, he held a knife in one hand and a wooden block in the other. When it was time to eat, he tucked the block into his pocket. What were you making? she asked. He shrugged. Nothing much. As soon as supper was over, Sarah had the children gather their dirty things and get dressed up for the dance. She decided to take Hannah's advice that evening and wear her blue dress, but she wouldn't change until the laundry was done. At the river, there were several other women there doing the same as she was. Poppy helped by handing her each item of clothing and she scrubbed it quickly in the river. Doing laundry on the trail was much quicker than at home because they didn't have much time. They didn't boil water, and they only used soap and scrubbed on rocks, rinsed, and hung it to dry. The half-day process became just an hour. As she finished rinsing and wringing out the last thing, she heard the musicians, and she smiled, knowing she'd be dancing with Elmer for the first time. As she and Poppy walked back to camp, she talked about how much fun the dance would be. Poppy frowned. But Jimmy and Johnny aren't here anymore. And you like dancing with them? Yes. I'm sure that either one of your brothers would be happy to dance with you. Just ask them. Sarah really didn't understand the problem. Poppy made a face. They both stink. I don't want to get too close to them. They stink? Sarah asked. I'll make them take a bath in the river tonight. Can I take a bath in the river too? Poppy asked. 
No, girls don't bathe in the river. I'm sick of being a girl. Can I be a boy? It's just not that simple. Now run along to the dance. I'll be there after I hang the clothes. Sarah tied a string from her wagon to the one beside it and hung all her laundry there. Then she found Hannah, who happily held up a blanket for her so she could change in privacy. She was shielded on both sides by wagons, to her front by the laundry hanging, and to the rear by Hannah. When she was ready, she looked at Hannah. I think I'm ready. Hannah smiled. I know you are. Chapter 7 Saturday, August 21, SUP ST, slash SUP, 1852. We are once again camped, where my father died. It seems strange to be here, but I had the opportunity to sit at his grave and talk to him about what has transpired since his demise. I need to remember that he and mother are together again, and probably dancing across all the clouds together, but, it's not that simple. My parents were not old people when they died and they were both in good health. Why has God taken them from us? Tonight is the first night I will participate in the dancing that happens in camp every Saturday night. I am looking forward to dancing with my Elmer, and he has made it clear that he wants me to dance with him. I think I'm developing feelings for him. He is a good man, which I was told over and over, but he's gentle and good with the children. I almost wonder if I deserve a man like him with my questioning God at every turn. I do hope the dancing will still be fun to watch, even without Edna Blue, to spin the night away and bump into people. Of course, there's always Bob and Mary, who do some demented form of wiggling around and call it dancing. They tend to crash into at least four other couples on any given night. I never went to a dance at home, but now I dream about going to dances there in Clover Creek. I will spend my evenings in the arms of Elmer, the man I love. Wait, love? Dare I say that? I've only really known him for a few days, and love doesn't come on that quickly. My mother once told me she didn't love my father until her third child was born. It took her that long to develop feelings with a man who she had pledged her life to. No, it can't be love yet. He just makes me feel comforted and that's why that word popped into my mind. Maybe someday I will fall in love with him with his sweet smile and hardworking ways, but I cannot guarantee it will happen. Putting her journal down, Sarah arrived at the dance late, but she immediately spotted her husband sitting with her siblings. Mary and Bob were on the dance floor, and sure enough, Mary had to keep apologizing to the people around them. Sarah was shaking her head as she sat down. Elmer looked toward her. Are you telling me you won't dance with me? Of course not. You're my husband. Who else would I dance with? Sarah sat beside Poppy and realized all three children were between her and Elmer. The next song, he asked. Sarah nodded to the dance floor. Watch Bob and Mary for a minute. They bump into everyone else at least four times per night. It might be best if we waited until they sit a song out before we attempt to dance. Elmer sat and watched Bob and Mary, laughing as he did. I think we'll be okay. I'll make sure my back is always to them to protect you. Are you sure? Sarah asked. You haven't seen the utter mayhem they cause. Between those two and Edna Blue, it was a game to see how many dancers they could each injure. Well, not really but it looked like it. We'll beat them at their own game, he said, taking her hand and helping her to her feet. We're not going to run people over like they are, she protested. No, but we're not going to let them run us over either. Elmer led her to the dance floor and pulled her into his arms. The song was a slow one, but that didn't stop Bob and Mary from doing a wild dance that was going to take someone's eye out. Sarah had never seen a couple as suited to one another as Bob and Mary were. Even their dance styles, if they could be called that, were similar. True to his word, Elmer kept his back to Bob and Mary, and when they bumped into him, he brought his elbow back, not too hard, but it hit Bob square in his side. 
Hey! Bob said. You can't do that on a dance floor. You bump into me, and I bump into you. Elmer knew Bob wouldn't confront him, so he held his ground. Bob sighed. I think we need to stay on the other side of the dance floor tonight. Elmer thinks he's the king of the dance. King Elmer? No, King Bob sounds so much better. Mary smiled. King Bob and Queen Mary. I'll remind Sarah of the real power couple here tomorrow. As they walked to the other end of the dance floor, Sarah couldn't help but laugh. I can't believe they're going to leave us alone. When others saw that Sarah and Elmer were alone on one side of the dance floor, they were slowly joined by other couples. First, Hannah and Jed, and then Margaret and Jamie. Both women were pregnant, and it wouldn't have been safe to dance near Bob and Mary. After Bob and Mary went to the other side of the dance floor, Sarah let herself sink into Elmer and truly enjoy dancing with him. Being held in his arms was the most wonderful thing she could ever remember experiencing. She rested her head on his shoulder and sighed contentedly. Elmer had become her rock in a matter of days. She felt safe with him, and it was a new feeling. It was six songs later when they left the dance floor, going back to sit with her siblings. Poppy looked at Sarah. You danced for a long time. It's my turn to dance with Elmer. Elmer looked surprised, but only for a moment. He held his hand out and Poppy took it, holding her head up high. Once on the dance floor, Poppy stood on Elmer's feet and he danced her around, smiling down at her happy little face. He truly felt as if he belonged in this new family of his, and that surprised him. Sarah wasn't even surprised by the tear that sprang to her eye. Her father had never interacted with his children the way Elmer was with Poppy. He'd been a good father and a good provider, but it never would have occurred to him to dance with Poppy the way Elmer was. Or in any way for that matter. He thought his role as a father began and ended with making a living. Sarah wouldn't have ever thought to want to dance with her father. But now, she could only think of how a real opportunity had been missed and it was now much too late to do anything about it. Elmer and Sarah spent as much time on the dance floor that evening as they did off it. Sarah felt closer to Elmer than she had, and she realized that he was a man she could fall in love with, much faster than after fifteen years of marriage too. Her parents had never been demonstrative, and Sarah assumed that they were affectionate behind closed doors, but now she wondered. Had her parents just never craved affection from one another? Whatever reason, she felt sad for them. That evening after the dance, Sarah made sure the children were bedded down before putting a blanket over her shoulder and taking Elmer's hand, leading him away from the camp. She knew she didn't have to do anything for a few days yet, but she needed Elmer to see how she felt about him. How much affection she had for him, and even her blossoming love. Maybe she couldn't say it yet, but she had a feeling showing him would make him just as happy. Once they were away from the others, she spread the blanket on the ground, and Elmer looked at her curiously. Are you trying to tell me something? he asked. Instead of answering, Sarah walked into his arms and rose up on her tiptoes to kiss him. Elmer didn't need any more prompting than that. His hands ran all over her body, and he slowly undressed them both. He wished he could see her, but it was just a quarter moon, and despite how bright the stars seemed, they didn't light her enough. He was certain it was all right though, because he would touch every inch of her and learn her body that way. When they finally laid down on the blanket and became one, Sarah wondered how she could have refused Elmer on that first night. She enjoyed what they were doing together, but she could tell he enjoyed it a great deal more than she did. Afterward, he held her close and covered her face with kisses. Thank you. Sarah grinned. Only Elmer would think to thank her after they consummated their marriage. Oh, no thanks necessary. We should try this again and again. He chuckled. Exactly what I was thinking. I wish we didn't have to sneak off into the night as if we were doing something wrong, but I'm sure it will be better in Clover Creek.
when we have a house with a door on the bedroom. You make a good point, she said. On their walk back to their wagon, they passed Bob and Mary who were headed out for some private time of their own judging by the blanket tucked under Mary's arm. Should we pretend we don't see them? Sarah whispered. Elmer laughed softly. If we pretend we don't see them, they'll pretend they don't see us. It's probably for the best if we don't think about what they're doing out here. Sarah didn't argue with him. She was sure he was right. She was just glad she had never seen her parents sneaking out onto the prairie. Never had it occurred to her why the young couples were always leaving camp while everyone else was sleeping, but now she understood completely. They wanted to love one another, just as she and Elmer just had. When they got back to camp, instead of crawling into their tent with Poppy, Sarah spread their blanket out and grabbed another from under the wagon to cover them. Maybe they wouldn't have privacy, but what could be more romantic than sleeping under the stars with her new husband? When Sarah woke in the morning, she realized she was snuggled up against Elmer. Thankfully, it wasn't dawn yet, so no one would have seen them. As she extricated herself from Elmer's embrace, he woke and wrapped his arms around her. I like being able to hold you, wife. I need to put our breakfast on. You can sleep for a little longer. Instead, Elmer got up and they folded their blankets together, putting them into the back of the wagon. Elmer took the small block of wood he'd been working with, and he pulled out a knife. While Sarah cooked, Elmer carved. What are you making? No idea, he said, but his hand shielded his project from her. Sarah frowned. Are you lying to me this early in our marriage? she asked. Not at all. I'm simply being evasive. See the difference? She laughed. I guess I do. I'm making Johnny cakes for the children again, she said, holding a mixing bowl against her stomach with one hand and using the other to stir the mixture. If you want anything else, I'm happy to make it. I'm not going to ask you to make two breakfasts. Besides, I've discovered I love Johnny cakes. You have good taste, she said, smiling at him. Of course, I do, he responded. Look who I married. Thank you for dancing with Poppy last night, she said softly. Father never spent time with any of us that way, and it looked so sweet. I know Poppy really enjoyed it. My father never did anything like that either, he said, but Ma always tried to find fun in everything we did. I remember dancing with her in the kitchen to an old music box. That sounds like a perfectly lovely time, she said, smiling at the thought. I should make certain to do that with my brothers. Do it soon. As soon as I was thirteen, I was done dancing with Ma. And then, who did you dance with? She found that she was a little jealous of any girl he'd courted before her. No one. I went to be an apprentice at sixteen, and all the time I wasn't helping my father on the farm, I was making furniture. At least you weren't out on the streets getting into trouble. He chuckled. All of my close neighbors were Amish. The Amish boys had no desire to get into trouble, so I was on my own. Ma taught me to read and write and do math. I never learned much of anything else other than crafting furniture, of course. Well, I wouldn't guess Amish boys would be inclined to trouble the way other boys are. Just don't teach my brothers to get into trouble, please. She carefully flipped the Johnny cakes onto five plates, handing Elmer's to him. I should have had you wake the children while I cooked. I never even thought of that. I'll remember tomorrow morning to wake them. He yawned. I miss taking Sundays off each week. I do too. She wouldn't miss the church service though. They'd taken to having them after walking all day on Sunday, and she would claim to be too tired. There was no way she was going to sit with other people to worship a god who had forsaken her. You're welcome to ride with me any time. I know the children are capable of caring for themselves for a few hours, Elmer said, waiting to eat until the children were awake. 
As soon as they were all gathered around the fire, he thanked God for the food and his new family. He couldn't believe how much he was enjoying being a father figure to her siblings. He genuinely cared for the children. Not like he cared for Sarah, of course, but he enjoyed being around them. After complimenting Sarah on their breakfast, he looked at Jack. Let's make sure we get a different pair of oxen today. Did your father have a rotation plan for them? Jack shook his head. He just chose whichever two looked fresh. Now, I don't know what it means for an ox to look fresh, but father always seemed to know which ones to choose. Well, I'll see if I can point out the fresh ones then. If you figure it out, you need to teach me. Are we going to have a ranch in Clover Creek like father wanted? Elmer thought about it for a moment. Do you feel like it would honor your father to have a ranch? Jack nodded. I do. It won't be a big ranch, but we'll have a ranch. Does that work? The smile on Jack's face was answer enough for all of them. Chapter 8 Sunday, August 22, SUP ND, SUP, 1852 My beautiful wife did not make me wait a full week. I'm enjoying the children more than I can say, so when Poppy, Sarah's youngest sibling, asked me to dance last night, I complied. She stood on my feet as we danced around. I much preferred dancing with my Sarah as anyone would expect, but I made sure to dance with Poppy enough that she felt as if she was my date as well. I told Sarah how my ma would dance with me in the kitchen to the tune of an old music box she had. Her parents weren't playful with her and her siblings, so she is going to try to dance with her brothers in the kitchen. This morning at breakfast, Jack, the older boy, asked if we were going to ranch like his father had planned. They were moving west to ranch, and they have more than enough oxen to start that ranch. I've decided that I will run a small ranch to honor him. I have a feeling one of the boys will want to make a living ranching, and I will pave the way for him to do that. It's only right. We're moving 25 miles again today. We'll have our church service after our day of travel, though. I know the church service will bring comfort to Sarah. She's gone to the service every week we've been on the trail. I will feel so proud to sit beside her and worship with her and her brothers and sister. I know that feels strange, but my Sarah is everything to me. If she wanted to ranch, I would give up all ideas of carpentry work, but only for her. I can't do it for my pa. Thankfully, she seems content with the idea of me making furniture, and she's even agreed to helping in whatever way she can. I would like to see one of the boys learn the trade, but if they would both be happier ranching, so be it. Maybe one of the sons, Sarah, and I have together would enjoy furniture making. I do believe it's the only trade truly suited to me. After their long day of travel, Sarah made a meal of beans with rice. Her siblings didn't complain because the last time they had, she told them she would happily throw it out, but she would never again cook anything for them. As they ate their supper, Elmer suggested just wearing their everyday clothes for church. God understands how hard this journey is on all of us, and he'll understand if we don't dress for worship. Sarah took a deep breath, her mind whirling. She had no intention of going to the service that evening. She may never even go again. I'm not sure I'm going to the service tonight. Why don't you take the children? Elmer looked at her, confused. Are you not feeling well? he asked. I'm fine. I was thinking of starting some bread while you are there, and I'll bake it before we go to sleep. I want to make the most of my time. Sarah couldn't force her eyes to meet his as she fibbed. She'd tell him later. Just not in front of the children. While Elmer and her siblings were at the church service, Sarah pounded out her frustration with God on a defenseless loaf of bread. She could hear the singing from across the camp, down by the river but she wasn't about to be part of it. She put the bread dough into a bowl and set it aside, covering the bowl with a clean cloth as her mother had taught her. She wasn't even certain why she did it, but she knew it was the way it was done. She looked all around her at the beauty of the earth, 
and she knew deep within her that God had to be real. Nothing so truly awesome could happen by chance. If only she could get past her anger, all would be good again. She wasn't sure one could call herself a Christian if she didn't attend church services, but she felt closer to God sitting there in nature, admiring his handiwork. A shadow fell across the campfire, and Sarah looked up to see Hannah. Why aren't you at the service? Sarah asked. Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. But my dear friend is hurting, and I'm not going to leave her sitting alone, baking bread as an excuse to get out of service. Hannah sat down on the ground beside Sarah. Talk to me about it. You don't want me to spew my vitriol. I'm furious with God. You're a preacher's wife. You shouldn't have to listen to me. I want to listen to you, Sarah. I really do. Tell me what's going through your mind. We started on this journey west because my father wanted to own a large ranch. With the free government land, he would have enough land to do what he wanted to do. We sold everything we owned. Everything. We only kept our clothing, and Mother kept her jewelry, music box, and her family Bible. Hannah nodded. Most of the company had similar stories. I had the choice of joining my family and moving west or staying and finding a job to support myself. I knew how treacherous the journey would be, so I decided to go along, to make the trek easier, for my mother. Sarah took a deep breath. When mother died just a couple of weeks into our journey, I cried, and I mourned her, but I knew it would all be fine, because I could do the laundry, the cooking, and mind the children, while father drove the wagon and took care of the oxen he'd brought with us, which he wanted to use to start his beef herd. Yes, I can see your reasoning there. Hannah looked at her expectantly, wanting to hear more of the story. We did well, with my father, the three children, and me. I don't mind hard work, and I pitched in and took over my mother's chores. Sarah hugged her knees to her chest. Then we made it to Clover Creek, and Father and I were both excited that it was the place chosen by the whole company. It was where we wanted to settle. Hannah smiled. I still see Clover Creek in my dreams. Sarah sighed. But Father died two days before we reached Oregon City. He's talked to me about Oregon City so many times, I thought my head would explode. But he was happy with the idea of starting his ranch. Why couldn't he have at least made it to Oregon City? Why did he have to die then? Would two more days have been too much to ask? Do you remember how your father died, Sarah? Of course, he fell out of his seat dead. But what led to that? Sarah sighed. He wouldn't drink cold coffee all day and kept drinking water straight from the rivers. Exactly. We know that we need to boil water. We don't know why, but we know it keeps people alive on the trail. That's why we all feed coffee and tea to babies barely old enough to toddle. So that they will stay safe. Hannah shook her head. He knew as we all did, he needed to only drink tea or coffee. Instead of listening to the doctor or anyone else about it, he drank unsafe water. Does that make it God's fault that he died? Don't try to reason with me while I'm busy being angry at God. Sarah said, but she knew deep down her friend was right. Was it good her father had been taken from her before they reached Oregon City? Of course not. Was it her father's fault or God's? She knew the answer to that as well. Even though she didn't want to admit it, she knew God had nothing to do with taking her father. I'm going back to the service now, but I want you to think about what I said. You can rage at God all you want, but it won't bring your father back, and it won't be God's fault it happened. Hannah stood and walked away, while Sarah sat on the ground, wanting to stay angry with God, but knowing she really couldn't. She took the dough and punched it down, kneading it a little more as she'd been taught. As she worked the dough this time, she was angry with her father, realizing the blame should be on him and not on God. Why hadn't he agreed to drink the cold coffee she and her siblings drank all day? 
She'd even served them all coffee instead of tea to please him. Finally, she put the dough in a baking pan, then added green sticks into her Dutch oven and put the baking pan in as well, atop green sticks. Then she covered it all with a cloth so it could rise once more. While she waited for the service to be over, she prayed, asking God to forgive her for being so angry with him. When the family came back to the campfire, she and Elmer got the children into their makeshift beds, and Elmer looked at her, as if trying to figure something out. Let's go for a walk. Sarah nodded. I'm going to put the bread on so it can cook while we walk and talk. She replaced the cloth with the lid of the Dutch oven and put the whole thing into the embers of the fire. She grabbed a blanket, just in case, and they walked away from camp. Why didn't you want to go to church tonight? I've never seen you miss a service. He was truly worried about her behavior. She usually seemed fine, but any time church was mentioned, she'd seem to shy away. I have been angry with God since my father died. I should have said something sooner. Hannah came to me during the service and showed me that I was wrong to blame God, and I am feeling a bit better, but now I'm angry with my father. Elmer sighed. What were you angry about? My father's death. You see, I was blaming him for losing both of my parents on the trail. But Hannah reminded me that the only reason my father died is he kept drinking water out of the river, instead of drinking the coffee I made for him. I prefer tea, but I made coffee and drank it all day, so he could have his coffee. But he didn't like cold coffee and didn't want to drink any coffee other than the mornings, so he always drank from the rivers, and he died. I prayed for forgiveness for being angry in the first place, and I'll be going to services again. Elmer wrapped his arm around her shoulders. I'm sorry you were so upset, and I wish you'd come to me. Sarah nodded. That's exactly what I should have done, but I felt like it was my problem, not someone else's. But you told Hannah. Hannah mostly figured it out. She's a smart woman, you know. I'm sure she is. He stopped walking and put his arms around her, kissing her softly. Are you feeling better now, or should we just go back to camp? Sarah smiled. I do feel better. Maybe we should take a longer walk. Will the bread burn? It won't. He took the blanket from her and spread it out, and before she knew what was happening, he was removing her dress. When they returned to camp, Sarah checked the bread and smiled. That was a good way for us to time the baking bread, she said, smiling at Elmer. She knew she should be a little shyer around him, but she wasn't exactly certain as to why. She decided to not pretend and just be herself. As they settled onto the ground the same way they had the previous night, Elmer talked to her some more about her feelings. I believe I'd be angry as well. Do the children know why you didn't go? Sarah turned on to her side, so she was facing her husband. They don't, and I'd rather they didn't. They don't need to know that their big sister had a meltdown when their father died. It would be harder for them to respect me. If that's how you want it to be, then that's exactly how it will be. I won't tell them anything you don't think they should know. Ever. I believe that should always be your choice. He stroked her cheek with one finger. I think many of the things about raising them should be decided together, but that's one thing that you can choose on your own. Thank you. Sarah scooted more toward him so they could sleep close to one another. If there's anything we need to discuss that's not related to my irrational feelings, then I'm happy to talk about it whenever you're ready. I do have a question. What? I want to know how many bedrooms you think the cabin needs. I mean, we need at least one so we can have privacy for our married adventures, but do we need two more? It'll only be for the winter. I think one is enough. The children can sleep on the floor. They're quite used to not using beds now. I will build us a bed, but I think we may be on the floor this first year as well. I guessed as much. You'll have time to build a cabin or time to make furniture. 
I'll take the cabin first, and the furniture later. It would be nice to have a table and chairs when you can make them work. Before they'd left Independence, she didn't think she'd have ever said that it didn't matter if she slept in a bed or not, but life on the trail had taught Sarah many things. One of the most important had been that her comfort wasn't the most important thing in the world. Then we'll wait with a bed until we build the new house. Why don't I make a table and two benches? We can all sit and eat together, but it will be much quicker. I'm going to need to build a fireplace, and you'll be cooking over that the first year. I hope that's all right. Everything else will come in time. Sarah nodded. That sounds perfect. I'm glad in a way that you're willing to run a small ranch. The boys have cattle ranches romanticized in their heads because of how long father was telling them we needed one. If you wanted me to just ranch, I would do it happily. I'd rather make furniture, but it doesn't matter too much to me. Elmer kissed the top of her head. Thank you for that. But no, a small ranch and you build your furniture shop. He sighed as he wrapped his arms around her and settled in for the night. He was much happier having Sarah to hold all night long. Chapter 9 Monday, August 23, SUP RD, slash SUP, 1852 I didn't go to our church service last night because I was too angry with God to go. During the service, Hannah had a talk with me and made me realize that my father chose to do things that he knew could cost him his life. For a while, I redirected my anger at father, but now I'm much calmer. Perhaps he felt the need to be with mother? As much as I didn't notice affection between them, they were married for more than twenty years, and I know there must have been some there. I feel content about the situation now, and I'm very quickly falling in love with my Elmer. It doesn't matter to me if it took my mother more than fifteen years to fall in love. I can do things my own way and my way is to choose to love my husband every day for the rest of my life. We are camped along the Columbia River, and I'm excited that we are headed back to our forever home in Clover Creek. With water at the ready and wood to be chopped, it will be a perfect place for all of us to settle. We'll have a doctor and a preacher and even a blacksmith. Whatever we need, we'll be able to take care of right there in town. Elmer and I have talked of a cabin for the first winter, because there will be very little time to build before the snows come. But he will build us a real house next summer, with at least four bedrooms, a kitchen, parlor, and a dining room. And a cellar. I'll have a cellar to store food. Oh, it all sounds like a dream come true. Granted, it will be another year, but I can live in that cabin for as long as I need to. I've been living out of a wagon for five months. What's a year in a cabin? Elmer has agreed to start a small ranch that one of the boys can take over when they are ready. I know he would like one of the boys to follow in his own footsteps, but he is honoring my father by starting a ranch. I just want a small homestead. I want to be able to plant a kitchen garden every year and breed the cattle. It would be nice to have a few chickens as well. Whatever happens, I know it will be good, because Elmer will make sure it is. Sarah made a point of walking with Mrs. King on Monday morning. Thank you for what you told me about Elmer. He's such a good man, and I don't know if I would have seen it without your advice. Mrs. King smiled. He is. Whether he and his father see eye to eye or not, they're both good men. She seemed pleased to hear that Sarah agreed her son was a good man. I sure hope our claims will be close to one another. My siblings could use grandparents, as well as the children Elmer and I will have together. Sarah wasn't sure how the older woman would feel about being a grandparent to a child that wasn't blood-related, but Mrs. King surprised her. Oh, thank you. I wanted a houseful of children, but God only gave me one. I would like at least twelve grandchildren. Sarah smiled. If I can carry them, I will have them. She had no qualms about having a large family. It simply seemed right to her. And now that my parents are gone, I would love the children to have a wonderful grandmother like you. 
Mrs. King's eyes filled with tears. Would your family like to join ours for supper tonight? She asked. I would love to get to know my three grandchildren. Sarah nodded. Would you like me to come early so I can help make it? Don't think I'm going to let you take the joy of cooking for my grandchildren from me. Mrs. King tried to sound as if she was scolding Sarah, but it didn't work out well. I made a large, strangely shaped loaf of bread last night. I could bring that to compliment whatever it is you make. Mrs. King nodded. That would be wonderful. I believe I shall make something my husband will hate but that the children will enjoy. He's going to be pleased to have the children there. With having just lost their father, they may be a bit standoffish for a while, but they've warmed up to Elmer, for certain. Sarah was glad she and her mother-in-law were of a like mind. And she realized that it wouldn't be just her and Elmer raising the children. It would be his parents as well. I don't think that will matter one bit to us, Mrs. King said. If one of your brothers or one of your sons is interested in learning about farming, I promise you that my Isaiah would be the best teacher they could ask for. Sarah nodded. Elmer told me to save a few of the potatoes I purchased in Oregon City, so I can plant them in the spring. Maybe we'll have a potato farm. Mrs. King laughed. I really don't think there will be a farm. Not if my Elmer has anything to say about it. Sarah nodded her agreement. That's true, but he agreed to start a small ranch for one of my brothers to take over, because that was my father's dream. That boy of mine really is a good man, isn't he? He is. After a while, Sarah went to sit on the wagon seat with Elmer. She had to give him a warning about them eating with his parents that night. Elmer looked at her, and a smile spread across his face. I sure do like it when you're close to me, he said. He put his arm around her shoulders and drew her closer. I feel exactly the same way, Sarah told him. I'm here for a reason though. What's that? he asked, coaxing the oxen to go a bit to the left of the trail because of a hole. I accepted a supper invitation from your mother. We're all going to be eating with your parents, and your mother said she'd fix something your father would hate but the children would love. He stared straight ahead for a long moment before nodding. I think it will be good if my parents can get to know you and your brothers and sister. I told your ma that she and your father would have to act as grandparents to my siblings, and she seemed overjoyed with the idea. And she wants us to have twelve children. He smiled at that. That doesn't surprise me even a little bit. She's the kind of mother who had a snack waiting for me every day when I came home from my apprenticeship, and she always made sure it was something Pa didn't like, so there was no chance he would eat it before I got there. Sarah laughed softly. Sounds like the perfect mother. Oh, she had her flaws, but I truly can't imagine a mother who would be better than her. Elmer's face was relaxed as he said the words, and Sarah knew he really thought a great deal of his mother. I'm glad you don't mind that I accepted. I went out of my way to walk with your mother this morning, so I could get to know her better. They're the only relatives we have left. He slid his arm around her shoulders. I promise I will make the next year of your life much better than the last has been. I'll do better every year, until things are so good, you don't remember anything bad ever happening to you. Sarah smiled. I'll make you keep that promise. You won't need to make me. He kissed her cheek and stroked her hair. How did I ever deserve a wife like you? She chuckled. You're the one who is special. Not me. She glanced at the terrain for the next bit before jumping down to walk some more. She liked being able to climb on the wagon seat and talk to him for a while, but the way the wagon shook her was downright painful. She wasn't going to ride any more than she absolutely needed to. As she walked back toward the other women, Poppy hurried toward her. Sarah, I want to ride with Elmer. He told me I could. Then let's go put you on the wagon with Elmer. Sarah took her sister's hand, hurrying back to where their wagon was in line, and helped her onto the wagon seat. 
Have fun writing. With a grin at Elmer, she walked back toward the other women. Once she had, she wondered why she hadn't just stayed where she was. It would have been so much easier than doubling up on part of the walk. Of course, she was used to walking, and it didn't hurt her. The rest of the day flew by as she thought about going to supper with the kings. She had no idea what Mr. King was like, never having really spoken to him, but she was determined to like him. He may have had issue with her husband's chosen profession, but she was certain he was a good man. How else could Elmer have come from him? After finishing up their daily walk, Sarah felt as if she didn't have any work to do, which was silly. A woman's work was never done, her mother used to say, and Sarah had realized how true her mother's words were. She dug in the back of their wagon and pulled out her mending basket, getting to work on clothes her brothers had ripped along the way. Mending was her least favorite task, and she tended to put it aside just as long as she could. When Elmer got to camp after taking care of the oxen, Jack trailing along behind him, she smiled at her husband. Do you have any mending that needs to be done? she asked. Since I don't have to cook tonight, I'm working on our mending, but realized I didn't have yours yet. He frowned. My mending is probably still in my mother's basket. She won't mind doing it and bringing it back to me, he said. I feel like I'm shirking my duties. I'll ask her about it this evening. He sat beside her on the ground, moving one hand to the nape of her neck, under her hair. You're the best wife a man could ask for. His kiss made her toes curl. Feel like going for a walk later? She nodded. I would love to go for a walk with you. Her body tingled as she thought about what the walk would entail. She'd never imagined she would enjoy making love with her husband, but every time, it was beautiful and special. See? The best wife a man could ask for. At supper time, they gathered the children from the different places they were playing and walked to his parents' wagon. Sarah was all smiles. I realized I haven't gotten Elmer's mending from you. From what I understand, one of the biggest joys of having a son marry is you no longer have to mend his clothes. Mrs. King laughed. I have always enjoyed mending my men's clothes. You should bring me your mending as I can see you don't enjoy it. It would be my pleasure to help you with the task. She laughed. Introduce me to these children of yours. Sarah smiled, pointing to each of her siblings proudly. This is Jack, he's eight. This one is Charles, he's seven. And the little girl is Poppy, who is six. Children, this is Elmer's mother, so she's your new grandmother. None of the children even questioned her words. Sarah knew Jack was old enough to know better, but he'd lost too much family to quibble. Can we call you Grandma? Jack asked. Mrs. King nodded and Sarah could see the tears brimming in her eyes. I would be very happy if you called me Grandma. Mr. King came into the camp then, looking confused to see Elmer and his new family. He looked into the pot, which held a mixture of sliced potatoes, what looked like chopped up jerky, and gravy. I don't want to eat this, he said grumpily. Mrs. King shot him a look that told him his words were unacceptable. I thought it would be nice to serve something other than beans for our new grandchildren's first meal with us. Mr. King looked stunned for a moment, before asking, Are either of you boys interested in farming? To Sarah's surprise, Charles nodded. Father wanted us to be ranchers, but I always liked the idea of having a farm one day. It would be fun to see what would grow. A smile transformed Mr. King's face and he no longer looked like a grumpy old man, to Sarah. He looked a lot like Elmer in that moment. What's your name, boy? Charles, but you may call me Charlie. I'd like that. You may call me Grandad. I'm too young to be a grandpa. Charles walked over to stand beside Mr. King, where he was sitting on the ground, waiting for his meal. Will you teach me to farm, Grandad? I would be the happiest man alive if you let me teach you to farm. 
Sarah's gaze met Elmer's over the top of Poppy's head. He was smiling. Now that I've found you a grandson who wants to farm, will you forgive me? The smile on Mr. King's face was the only answer any of them needed. He was thrilled to teach a boy to be a farmer. Especially when he could call the boy his grandson. When Sarah looked over at Mrs. King, she could see tears in the older woman's eyes again. What can I teach you, Poppy? Mrs. King asked. I want to learn to make rag dolls, Poppy said. My favorite doll fell in the river a long time ago, and I want another. I will teach you to make them then. I love to sew. Would you let me make you a dress? Poppy looked at Sarah to see if it was all right, and Sarah nodded. Yes, please. I like yellow and blue best. Maybe we'll make your rag doll a dress that matches yours, Mrs. King suggested as she started serving each of them a bowl of food. As they all sat on the ground for their meal, Mr. King said a prayer, thanking God for his new family. Sarah didn't need to hear the words he was saying to know how he felt. He was thrilled to have grandchildren, especially when one wanted to learn to farm. Chapter 10 Monday, August 30, SUP, TH, SLASH SUP, 1852 Thanks to Sarah, my relationship with my father has been restored. I don't know how she so easily accomplished something that had taken all the months on the trail to destroy. When I first saw Sarah in Independence, I fell in love with her beauty, but I didn't know or care a great deal about what kind of personality she had. Now, I still see her beauty, of course, but it's her heart that has made me a captive. She never complains about being left with three children to feed and care for. She simply does her job as their new mother. I truly believe she is one of the most caring and beautiful women in all the West, and I am pleased that she is mine. My wife. My love. My everything. It should not take much longer than three weeks for us to reach our destination in Clover Creek, and as soon as we arrive, we will start building shelter for the winter. I am thrilled that her brothers will help me, but even happier that my father and I will work together to accomplish the task. He chose the plots beside my own, and we will be happy to have them as not only parents, but also as our closest neighbors. The idea of being able to go to Ma and pause for supper whenever we wish to makes me extremely happy. And Sarah and I can have them over as well. All jobs are easier with two pairs of hands working on them, and that's what my father and I will do. We will work together to get our homes built. I will need to build a barn as well, I think. Maybe not a full barn, but enough for the oxen we have with us to shelter in through the winters. Pa doesn't plan on raising livestock. He wants to grow food, not be a dairyman. If he keeps his oxen, they can use my shelter for the winter. Perhaps he will allow me to have them to help start our herd. Jack insists he wants to be a rancher, and I will help him work toward that goal. What better gift could I give him than a ranch that is already profitable? After putting down his journal, Elmer looked at his wife just across the fire. His gift for her was almost complete, and he prayed she would like it. He'd worked on it almost every day since they'd married. He planned to give it to her during their walk that night. As he watched, Sarah flipped the Johnny cakes, and he took that as his cue to wake up the children. He woke the boys first, and despite their grumbles and eye rubbing, they got up, going to find a place outside of camp to relieve themselves. Then he ducked his head into Poppy's little tent, and when she saw who was waking her, her face lit up. Elmer. Is it breakfast time? It is. How's my sweet girl today? Sleepy, but I can wake up if there are Johnny cakes waiting for me, she said, rubbing her eyes. Your sister has them almost finished, he said in a whisper, as if it was a big secret. Poppy grinned, wrapped her arms around his neck, and gave him a loud, smacking kiss on the cheek. I love you, Elmer. The words surprised him, but also made him feel sad. He and Sarah hadn't said the words to one another yet. He felt them, but he didn't know how she felt. 
He knew then he would put his heart on the line that night during their walk and tell her how he felt. It was the right thing to do. Poppy hurried out to join Elmer and Sarah for breakfast. Where are the boys? Can we eat without them? I'm hungry. Sarah shook her head at her sister. We can wait a few minutes for the boys to come back. Poppy sighed dramatically. I think I will probably starve to death. Elmer made a big show about taking one piece of bacon and handing it to her, while Sarah pretended not to see what happened. She was quite amused at the team Elmer and Poppy had formed. The little girl danced with him as often as she could talk him into it. Sarah had danced with both of her younger brothers on Saturday night. Jack had seemed torn between letting himself enjoy the moment and wanting to pretend he didn't want to dance with her. Sarah didn't care. She loved her brothers, and she was going to make their lives full of special moments, now that she knew she could. It was odd that she'd always accepted the way her parents raised her as the only way possible. Now she knew better, and she was going to make the most of it. When the boys came back to camp, Sarah handed them each a plate before bowing her head for their morning prayer. Her feelings of anger, toward both God and her father, had dissipated. She missed her father horribly, but she no longer blamed him for causing his own death. What was the point? Her anger was only hurting her, not anyone else. So she chose to forgive, so she could have a happy life. While they ate breakfast, they all talked about what they were going to do that day. I'm walking forever, Poppy said. But I think I may ride with Elmer too. He needs me to help him know the route. Sarah smiled at that. The oxen just plodded along where there was a path, following the wagon in front of them. There wasn't much driving involved. In fact, some of the men led their oxen and didn't sit on the wagon seat to drive it. Usually, it depended on how much weight they had in their wagons. For larger families, it was harder to drive because there was only so much the oxen could pull. The boys talked about how they were going to walk with some of the Mitchell boys. When they'd first left Independence, the Mitchell boys had seemed like perfectly acceptable companions. They had, however, spent a great deal more time with the Cauldron boys than they should have, and now they got into a great deal of mischief. She'd seen Mary climb trees to get her brothers down more than once. Of course, climbing trees was one of those things that Mary did that other young ladies weren't allowed to do. She'd been raised to shoot and act like a boy, though, so none of that bothered her. That evening, they once again had supper with the kings but this time Sarah cooked for them all. We'll always take turns, Sarah said. There's no reason all of the burden should be on you. Cooking for my grandchildren will never be a burden, Mrs. King said. I know. Just let me do my share so I don't feel like I'm taking advantage of your kindness. Mrs. King had relented, but Sarah could tell she hadn't wanted to. Sarah pictured the two King households being just on their own side of the property line, so she and Mrs. King could visit easily in the winter. They'd visit all year, but hopefully in the summer, they wouldn't be trudging through several feet of snow to do it. Sarah made one of her favorite trail meals, which was cut up jerky, a gravy, and rice. Mr. King had glared at his plate, but after taking a bite, he'd nodded. This is a fine supper, Sarah. I suppose I will let you cook for my grandchildren. They all laughed at that, even Elmer. The two men had started talking again, and they were making plans to help each other with the building as soon as they arrived at Clover Creek. After supper, Sarah and Elmer put the children to bed, and they went for their walk out onto the prairie. It had become something they did nightly, and Sarah was quite happy with their little tradition. Of course, she looked forward to the days they could simply make love in their bedroom once they'd reached Clover Creek, but for now, walks worked well. While Sarah was spreading out their blanket on the ground, Elmer dug in his pocket for the present he'd made her. When she turned around, he took her hands in his and said, Sarah, I love you. More than I thought possible. 
When I saw you in Independence, I admired your beauty. Now I admire your spirit and your love for others. Sarah smiled. I love you as well, Elmer. I don't know why you didn't approach me sooner, but I'm so glad you finally came to me. You are exactly what I needed after my father died, and I thank God for you every day. He took the gift and put it in her hand, watching her face by the light of the half-moon. Sarah looked down at the object she held. It was a stick with a sharp end and carved into the other end was a rabbit. This is beautiful. For my hair, she asked, not wanting to use it for something other than its intended purpose. He nodded. I noticed you have been wearing your hair up a lot, with it being so hot, and I thought this might help you. Oh, it's wonderful. She threw her arms around him and hugged him close. I can't believe you made this for me. I'll probably make one for Poppy as well, but I wanted yours to be made first. Do you like it? he asked. I absolutely adore it. I'll wear it proudly. Sarah looked up into his face and smiled. Less than two weeks ago, I was certain my life was over. I didn't think I'd ever marry, and if I did, it would be to a man with a lot of children he needed help with. But you, you not only asked me to marry you, but you made my life so much better. The children love you. I love you. I don't know why I didn't take one look at you and know you were the man I was meant to marry. I don't either. I knew it the second I set eyes on you. Well, I certainly know now. You've made all of us love you with your quiet ways. I love your parents. I can't believe all of this came from me needing a driver. He chuckled. I needed a wagon as well. Don't forget that part of things. I don't think I could. She took a deep breath. We're going to all reach Clover Creek without dying, aren't we? She still worried about everyone, but she could see they were so close to making it alive. Elmer nodded. I'll do everything in my power to make that happen, and I will do my very best by you for the rest of our lives. Sarah smiled. I know you will. You've already taught the children so much. My parents will teach them a great deal more, he said. I know. I'm so happy your parents just embraced all three of my siblings as grandchildren. The children are thrilled and so are your parents. It was like they were all waiting to meet one another. Sometimes, Poppy walks with your ma instead of walking with her friends. Ma told me. She's so happy that you suggested to her they were her grandchildren. Ma wanted a big family, but she was never able to get pregnant again after me. Having three ready-made grandchildren with the hope for more, it makes her the happiest woman on earth. Especially since we're all settling so close together. Sarah rested her forehead on his shoulder. I think that's perfect. I'll have the help I need with the children, and you have your father back. Did I ever thank you for making it easy for Pa and I to see eye to eye for the first time since I started apprenticing? You don't have to thank me for anything. I'm learning so much from you about a better way to raise children. A way that makes the children feel loved and valued. I danced with both boys this weekend, and though they both acted as if they didn't want to, when we got out onto the dance floor, they were pleased. My parents were the type of people who thought children should be seen and not heard. They would both say, spare the rod and spoil the child as if it was a battle cry. Did you get spanked often? He asked, not realizing her parents had been so different from his own. Oh, yes. All the time. Father expected me to be the same with my younger siblings after mother died, but I refused. I mean, I swatted their hands once or twice, but I never did more. Well, we're going to raise our children differently than either of our parents raised us. We won't be using the rod as often. And I won't tell any of them they have to go into a certain occupation simply because it's what I do. They'll have choices. That's all I ask. Sarah smiled. I can't wait to have a child of our own. We need a little boy who wants to do nothing but build furniture. 
He chuckled. I would like that, a lot, but I'm not going to force any of them to do, as I want them to do. Besides, maybe we'll have all little girls who look just like their mother and learn to cook as well as she does. No, we need little boys to teach to be sweet, kind men. Knowing your mother will be able to help me with that makes it all sound easy. Sarah smiled. We'll be in Clover Creek in just a few weeks, and we'll be choosing the spot for our home. Do you have any idea how excited I am to have my own home to organize and clean? You like to clean? he asked, surprised. It's not my favorite task in the world, but I will do it with a smile. Because I have a wonderful husband and three children I already love. And more soon. So many more. Just don't say that around my ma. She'll start asking you every day if you're expecting yet. Sarah laughed. She's already told me she wants at least a dozen grandchildren. I don't know if that's counting my siblings or not, but either way, I'll have as many children as God will give me. Elmer smiled, tracing her cheek with his index finger. And we're going to live happily ever after, right? There's no other way we could live, 